Hi, welcome to Instrumental Analysis. I'm Vicki Colvin. In the second lecture of week eight, we're going to be delving a little bit more into potentiometric sensors, or sensors that rely on the measurement of voltage to derive something about an analyte. We're going to go back to the Nernst equation, which I briefly introduced in the last lecture. I'm not going to be expecting you to be quantitatively familiar with that. I simply want you to have seen it and understand that that equation is the reason you can relate the potential that you may be measuring in one of these cells with a concentration of the analyte. I also want you to be familiar with the terminology reference electrode, indicator electrode, and junction potential, and have some sense of where and why we use all of those components in measurement of potentiometry, and specifically how to think about a junction potential. So potentiometric methods are electroanalytical methods that measure the potential of a cell as a way of getting at the concentration of an analyte. So I want to start by giving you some concept of what potential really means. And I'm going to do that with this picture of a cliff with a castle on top. So what if I asked you, how high up is the castle? I want you to give that some thought. Because electrochemical potential is very much like potential energy. So if I asked you, what's the potential energy of something sitting on top of the castle? Well, you could answer the question a couple of different ways. You could decide that my question, how high up is the castle, refers to the distance from the castle to all the way to the bottom of the cliff or the ground level down by the sea. That would be one way of defining how high something was or what the potential energy is. Because remember, potential energy is always about differences. But another person might come along and say, wait a second, I thought it was the, how high it was from the surface of the cliff where it's sitting. And interestingly enough, it would depend However, if you did your measurements correctly, you could go between the height on top of the cliff versus the height relative to the seafloor. And in fact, this concept is something we're going to see when we build potentiometric cells, because we're going to have to have a reference electrode. So that reference electrode is going to basically set a reference point for all future measurements. So whether that's the seafloor or the top of the cliff, it kind of doesn't matter as long as we know what that reference electrode is relative to some other universal reference system. So it's kind of like once you've done some laser interferometry to know exactly what the height is of that beach relative to you know, the Earth, you can then figure out how high the castle is in an absolute sense. It's a very similar idea. But what I want you to take home is that if you're measuring potentiometric data, you must have a reference electrode to define not where a zero is, because none of the reference electrodes actually are zero, but to give you a fixed measurement so that you can actually measure the potential effectively. You can't just plunk an electrode in a solution and measure a potential. You must have a second electrode that provides you a reference for that indicator electrode. So here exactly then is what a simple potentiometric sensor might look like. You have something called your indicator electrode, which is the electrode that's sort of where all the action occurs in terms of the Nernst equation. It's the electrode potential that's going to be shifting with the concentration of the analyte. Then you have a reference electrode, and that's electrically connected, right? So you're measuring the relative height of your indicator, but that reference electrode is a bomb. It's not going to be changing. It's just going to be sitting there in a very stable way. And as your indicator electrode may change around, as your analyte concentrations change, your reference electrode should always be the exact same number. So when you see measurements or do measurements and get changes, it's only due to your analyte concentration. So that reference electrode is important. We'll talk about that in a moment. But I want to go back to the indicator electrode first. And finally, the junction term we'll also talk about the, at the end. So the indicator electrode then in the first type of potentiometer, your book introduces two. The second one's a little complicated to follow if you haven't had the electrochemistry, so I'll just stick with the simple one. The simple one is say you want to measure the concentration of copper 2 in a solution. Well, the simplest and easiest thing to do is to literally put a copper electrode, ideally with a copper wire, into the solution with a reference electrode and measure the potential. That would be the simplest thing to do because then you really only have the copper half reaction to worry about. And so you can very simply use this indicator expression, as I show here, derived in your book, to calculate how the indicator potential changes as a function of copper 2 plus concentration. It's a particularly unique thing because your electrode surface is, of course, the same thing as the ion in solution. So you're directly 
measuring that half reaction. Now, I want to point out one other important feature of this potentiometric cell, and that is the presence of a salt bridge, because that's going to become important in some of our later discussions about junction potentials and ion selective electrodes. So salt bridges are kind of confusing things um, in electrochemical cells. And what they basically are there to do is if you had just a reference electrode and just the copper in solution, then what would happen is they would each build up a uh, basically a lot of charge at their surface because they end up with different electrochemical potentials. And because of that charge, you would actually have a difficult time achieving the true electrochemical potential because this charge would make it hard for that voltage to achieve its final state. And so you need to put something called a salt bridge in that sort of neutralizes any charge buildup at either electrode. So the salt bridges have a couple of features. They're usually sponges. Think of them as really big sponges that contain both positive and negative ions. And as the solution develops a little bit too negative or a little bit too positive, so if it's a little, getting a little bit too negative, all of a sudden potassium ions come out and they sort of charge balance. If it's getting a little bit too positive, chloride ions come out and they also charge balance. So the point of a salt bridge is to keep the solution charge balanced because one thing you know for sure is that you're never going to be doing electrochemistry and charge up the solution. That's going to be thermodynamically very unfavorable. So those salt bridges allow the solution to sort of do what it's going to do from an electrochemical point of view without having to worry about paying prices because, for example, the net charge in the beaker is changing as a function of time. You don't want that to happen. And so that's what the function is of the salt bridge. Um, and it can be built into the reference electrode as opposed to the classic bridge you might remember from freshman chemistry. Okay, just wanted to point out that feature. So let's talk a little bit about the reference electrodes. Um, reference electrodes you buy from a company and you plug them into your voltmeter. The only thing you really need to know when you're choosing them is you really got to have a choice of a saturated mercury chloride solution or a silver chloride. Those are kind of the two standards. And the real honest to goodness true standard is basically a hydrogen electrode, which is exactly at zero volts on the sort of standard reduction potential scale. But those are really hard to handle. They involve a gas. So traditionally, you don't use those. You use either a calomel or a silver silver chloride. And what this table shows, I want you to take a look at and think about what you want that reference electrode to do. So you can see that there's a couple of difference um, depending on the concentration of the calomel or the concentration of the silver. You can see different potentials, and that's what you would expect based on the Nernst equation. However, you'll also see one axis is temperature. And I want you to take a look and think about what's this table trying to tell us. Well, if you're selecting a reference electrode, especially if you don't have really great temperature control in your laboratory or you're out in the field, let's say, you do not want that reference electrode to change its potential. You need it to be rock solid stable. So what this table tells us is that some electrodes are better than others at being rock solid stable. I'll let you take a, a look at it, and I think from that you might be able to derive why some people typically use a calomel electrode. But what is it you want it to say? Well, ideally, you don't want the potential to change at all with temperature, because if it's changing with temperature, it's going to be introducing a systematic error into your analysis that's going to be very, very hard to correct for unless you calibrate it every temp, you know, either temperature control accurately or you have to calibrate you know, with wide variations in temperature. So that was just to make a point about, first of all, the typical electrodes you're going to find are a calomel or a silver chloride. And you do have to worry a little bit about temperature dependence and the stability of these electrodes over time. The final point, and perhaps the most important point of this lecture, is the concept of the junction potential. This is a real bugaboo. This is one of those, in the perfect world, it wouldn't exist. So in freshman chemistry, you wouldn't have worried about your junction potential. But in analytical chemistry, it's everything. And the reason is it can be very small relative to the voltages you're measuring, depending on how much of concentration of substance you have. But what its problem is, is that it can introduce a lot of systematic error into the measurement. So let's first of all understand conceptually what the junction potential is. So a junction potential happens whenever there's a solution A and a solution B that have different concentrations of electrolytes in them. So I show you this one example. Imagine you had a salt water solution coming up right against a fresh water solution. And there would momentarily be an interface before they fully mixed. Now, in that moment before they're fully mixed and how they're going to fully mix is that sodium and the chloride are both going to be diffusing into the water. 
but the mobility of chloride into water is actually higher than the mobility of sodium. So chloride is going to move faster into that water. So if you imagine a race going on, the chloride is going to get ahead of the sodium. And so you're going to have a region that's depleted in chloride because it's moved ahead and has excess sodium, and then a region that's negative because it's got excess chloride. So what you do is you create from a charge neutral solution an interface in which one of the charges is ahead of the others. In this case, it's going to be chloride. So you're going to create a potential pointing the other way. Now, you might say the chloride will keep, you know, keep and keep going and going, but what happens in this process is that the chloride Actually, as it's starting to diffuse and get ahead of itself, it's starting to meet a potential gradient because there's an electrostatic price it has to pay to really pull away from those sodium ions. So it can't keep going. So the junction potentials are usually very, very thin potentials, meaning spatially not very far. And so you sort of tr balance. You know, it's, it's diffusing faster, but as it diffuses out, Actually, the mobility is not the only thing. It starts, you know, basically as it diffuses, it gets to a steeper and steeper and steeper wall, and then it sort of stops. And so the thickness, it's called a double layer that develops, is actually the source of your junction potential. And you're going to get that in a lot of different places in your electrochemical cells. Um, you're going to get it at your reference electrode, because the reference electrode is going to have one type of solution inside of it and another type outside of it. And you can get junction potentials across interfaces. Here I've drawn, just imagine, two solutions that came into intimate contact. In many electrochemical cells, you're going to find that those junction potentials develop at interfaces, where an ion is actually diffusing through either a polymer or even glass that can develop a very small amount of um, charge differentially on one side as opposed to the other. So the mobilities of ions then help us to find both the direction is the negative going to get ahead of the positive, and then which solution is going to go. You know, the negative is going to go first, or the positive is going to go first, and it also helps us to find the magnitude. Now, to give you some scale for how important this is, um, a junction potential of, let's say, 0.1 molar HCl against 3.5 molar KCl, which is exactly what you would have at the salt bridge, because remember the salt bridge is attached to the reference electrode, and it's like a spongy sodium chloride. Well, if that sodium chloride <laughs> sponge is sort of immersed in a solution that's 0.1 molar HCl, a junction potential is going to develop actually at the reference electrode. And that junction potential is going to be about 3.1 millivolts. And that's going to modify the reference voltage that you think is all reference is not. It's going to have a junction potential term. And that's this how we think about junction potential, is it kind of is an additional term that can add or subtract from a potential depending on which ions are involved and which ones move faster and in what direction. So it's even hard to know the magnitude. It's also hard to know the direction of a junction potential. So it's a very complicated and difficult systematic error to deal with. So to sort of summarize this brief discussion of potentiometry, you would make a potentiometric measurement by building basically a simple electrochemical cell. Your book talks about two types. We talked about what if the metal analyte you were interested in, you use the solid zero valent metal as your electrode, and then you get this very nice reduction in Dernst equation. Um, you have to have a reference electrode because you're measuring the potential of your indicator electrode has to, you have to have a zero point. And you want that reference electrode to always, always, always have the same potential no matter what. And as we saw, temperature can introduce some systematic error into this. You're going to have a salt bridge in the system because that's going to help you sort of mediate the net positive negative charge in the whole beaker. But the presence of that salt um, is going to actually create the potential for a junction potential at that interface. And that can swing and cause a shift in systematic shift in your data. And so understanding the junction potential and finding ways to calibrate to uh, correct for it is a really, really important part of applying potentiometry. And we'll talk about that more in the next lecture. Thanks so much, and see you next.